Excellent. So let's get started now with week five and we're still on schedule. And today we're going to see some elements of inheritance and polymorphism, which is typically where I end if I give a very introductory course. So I'm happy that, you know, this is all starting to kind of fall into pieces and that the schedule is kept. So this is what we see today. And today is, is, is not that much in terms of content. However, I think also there the, the, type of, um, the type of concepts that we're dealing with has become a little bit more complicated. I hope you already saw that last week or no, two weeks ago in our last lecture, where um, I think some people already addressed me and said that they had problems with these new things. If you have questions, then ask us in the exercise sessions or by email and make sure those questions are specific enough. Just saying I don't understand it is not enough. You know, you need to point us at something. And today we're going to see inheritance, uh, plus everything that you can get along uh, with inheritance concepts. Now inheritance, as uh, a definition, uh, in programming at least, is something that allows us to extend objects and classes that we already have with extra functionality and or extra attributes, so that they are a little bit more specific. Um, and that, you, that we uh, deal with by saying there are parent classes and child classes, which are sometimes also called general classes and specialized classes, or also base classes or super classes and subclasses. It's all the same, or typically when I use those uh, words, uh, I mean exactly the same. So you have a class and you can derive another class from this particular class. Um, and a specialized class is consistent with the base class, meaning it will have exactly the same footprint, it will have the same attributes, it will have the same functionality, so the same methods, but it can, on top of that, add some extras. And because of that, it is more specialized. At the same time, if you have an object that is a subclass of a superclass or a base class, then you can use those to exchange them at certain locations. So if you have a function, which has then as one of its parameters, for instance, a particular class, then you can also enter there a subclass of this particular class. And that's how then inheritance starts usually making sense um, and usually becoming also a lot more powerful to deal with um, once you start creating your own classes and then starting um, declaring objects of those classes. Um, and the generalization part is something that you can read upon in this, uh, in this URL that I put there. Um, so it's, it's really about if you have an object that is created from a subclass, then this can be seen as an object of that superclass um, as well. And that is, that is then typically allowing us certain things that we will talk about later today, uh, especially when you talk about polymorphism. So this is a typical example you get them to see. So we have a class person. This person has the attributes name, address, birth year. Those are all private, you know, can only be changed within the methods of that class. And we have some public methods called print batch and get h. Now this is a bit of a silly example because we don't have any constructor, as you can see. You know, we can't do that much. But conceptually, you know, this could be a class for representing a person in your software. And then Typically, you could then say there are different types of people or persons that I want to deal with. So you could then derive from that uh, the class staff as well as the class trainee. Those are two different classes with different properties, but they kind of borrow everything that is, uh, uh, that is there in person. And you do that by uh, this notation. You basically have the colon and then public, typically, person. Uh, to say staff is a subclass of the superclass person, or trainee is a subclass of the superclass person. And that way, both staff and trainee have what a person has, and on top of that, the things that you see listed here. So a staff has a salary, and as a method can then set that salary. A trainee has a star day, and it has a method, as a method, has uh, a days in training method that returns how, of how many days that person was training for. And they're both persons, but at the same time, they're more specific. They are a staff or a trainee. Right, and that means when you, when you have that, when you have this inheritance, that, uh, for instance, if you create objects of uh, staff or objects of a trainee, 
like new staff and new trainee are over here, they can access everything that is uh, uh, public from person. So basically new staff can be treated like a person. So you could also here, for instance, add an object of type person and then say person uh, or p.printbatch, but the same can be done with new staff. Even though new staff is not directly a person, it is a, so, so a subclass of person, but therefore can still access the method print batch, which is a method of person, right? And the same about get age. Get age is a method of a person, but the trainee over here, object, can then also access this particular method. What they can do is access these attributes over here, like name and address, because those are private. Private here means really that those are private to the class members alone, not to the child class or subclass uh, members, right? So that, that is something that we already knew. The new thing with inheritance is that we can, fi we, we can um, uh, access everything that is public to this class. Now, we see here public. We can also have private here, for instance. That is a possibility. It's not done in many languages. Other programming languages uh, usually do public inheritance. Um, but you can uh, do private inheritance. We see this later. For instance, if you pass um, a, a subclass through a function, even though the parameter was actually a, a superclass. So then certain things are not possible because this would be private inherited. Okay? So this is, this, but this is typically what we're not going to see in the first or in the next couple of weeks. Typically, when you inherit, you inherit publicly. That means. Uh, you, have, uh, you, you can access everything that is public from the, from the main class. All right. <clears throat> this allows us then to also uh, introduce a third type of keyword within the class that kind of signifies everything that follows is, and we already knew, private or public. And those were, I think, clear. Everything that is private means you can only access those in the class members, not outside, you know, function that uses this class, like main or some other function where this, uh, a method was uh, declared of that class. So that would not be uh, allowed to access this uh, method or attributes. On the other side, you have public. Public members are accessible from anywhere. So if you create an object of this class, you can do object dots, and then you can access the, the attribute or the methods because it's public. Now, protected is something in between. It means that um, things are accessible only, so it's not public, because you can't just do object dot and then uh, access that protected uh, method or that protected attributes. You basically uh, can only do this from the child classes, um, but uh, you can all, uh, do this from the child classes. That's what more or less what I said, and that's what is what is uh, marked here in yellow. And this is. Fairly simple, but I think it's uh, not always very clear from the start, so I'm going to give a couple of examples here. So here we have our class person again, and in this case we just switch one of the attributes that we already had, the name for instance, to protected. Now in this case, if this is protected, that means that in a method of a child class or a subclass, we can then access name still. We can do, we can change the name, we can uh, get the value of that name, it is not private, it's protected. However, outside of these three classes methods, we can't still access name. So name can be accessed from the main function, as you see over here. If we have new staff as an object of staff of this class over here, then over here we can't um, access new staff, dot name, right? Na name is protected. Protected means it's only accessible in methods that belong to those subclasses of, of that person. So what is possible, for instance, if we would have in days in training over here, so we have um, uh, um, an object or we have a class trainee, which is a child class or a subclass of our class person, where name is a protected uh, attribute. In that case, in days in training, which, which is a method over there, we can access name over here and we can change it. So we can then, for instance, just output this to the console. This would be fine. What would not be fine is accessing birth year, because birth year is, prote is uh, not protected, but private in person, and we are in the class trainee, right? So that is the, the difference. 
between private and protected in that case. I hope that is clear. Um, then you might ask yourself, so what is happening in her inheritance with the constructors? Because typically if you inherit things, you inherit methods, you inherit um, uh, um, attributes. Constructors, however, are a completely different deal. And there we kind of remind ourselves and also refresh a little bit of a notation that we've already seen two lectures ago. So if you have a, a constructor of a particular class, so in this case we have an, a class called example with a particular constructor over here. Um, and the constructor over here just takes an integer reference over here. And, um, and, and the idea is, of course, that you would uh, initialize, it, uh, initialize this attribute uh, to what you have over here. Now, since it's a reference, you can do this in the body of the constructor. It's the same problem that we've seen for the constant last time. So if you have a constant, you need to immediately assign it a value, and then that constant can't be changed anymore. You can, however, have a constant in a class. You can have a reference in a class, but... Like we've seen, you need to assign those immediately. You can't do that in the body of a constructor. So you need to do this in this particular syntax. You need to say our constant now immediately begets the value of 47. And similarly, we need to say our reference, in this case, gets the reference of a var, uh, which, we, uh, uh, which are passed then as a, as, a, as a parameter. So this is kind of the notation that we already know to set certain attributes to a certain default value or to something that is passed through the constructor, right? So we have this colon and then um, separated by commas, the uh, attributes that we want to assign a value to and then what we assign it to, right? That's, and that can be done for constants, can be done for references. And that's the only way we can do this for references and constants. But we can also do this for any other type of attribute in our class. Now, this notation, and this is getting tricky now, is exactly how you're going to call from the constructor of a subclass or a child class, the constructor of a superclass or a parent class. That means this over here on the right side, marked yellow, is not an attribute of this class subclass. It's actually the constructor of the superclass. Yeah? So in this case, what, we happen, what happens if you create an object of class subclass, and we provide a Boolean, so this constructor over here is called. In that ca case, this constructor first calls the base class constructor that answers to this signature over here, which is this over here, and then this, is this variable is basically passed over here. Right? So that is a possibility. Uh, the same, as I said already, like if I have an, an own attribute, like my bool, which is a Boolean, I can give this uh, the value my bool. They have exactly the same name as we've seen, but this, this is not a problem in this notation either. What is before the parentheses or the, the braces is our attributes. What is between the parentheses is what we pass as a parameter. It's a little bit tricky, but I think once you get used to using this, it is actually quite uh, neat because it's short. And in many cases, you can create constructors without having a body at all, like over here. You basically say this constructor launches the base ca class constructor and then fills in a couple of our attributes as values, and that's it. And this is something that you can then shorten like this without having to even implement our constructor explicitly. Right? So that is what is possible there. Now, so that is possible. What you can also do, and this is exactly the same notation, is do this for constructors of the same class. This is called delicate, constru uh, delicate constructors. That means we are now having a class which is not inheriting from another class, but which has multiple constructors with different signatures. As we say last time, or two lectures ago, you can do this. And typically people do this. You can have a copy constructor, you can have a default constructor, you can have a constructor with two uh, parameters, you can have a constructor with one parameter, etc. And you can have all of those together. Like here we have three different types of constructors. And typically you might want to do one thing for those constructors that is kind of common to all of those. Like here, for instance, I have this one constructor called my class where I give an integer and a boolean, for instance. Okay. 
as parameters. And I initialize those, but then I do some extra work. I create, for instance, a dynamic array or a big, uh, uh, a big um, construct somehow. And this takes a lot of work and lots of programming. I don't want to duplicate this. So what I can do is I can launch this particular constructor with these particular parameters right over here through other constructors. Just like we just saw, you can do this for the base class in a subclass or a, a superclass in a subclass. Okay? It's all the same notation, so it should not be that more that difficult. And basically what is before the parenthesis is just an attribute or the class name, basically, because it's a constructor. And this class name could be the name of a parent class or a subclass, a superclass, or it could also be an attribute of the local class. Now, those are the two options. The notation is the same for all of them. Uh, yes? Um, so we are giving the default value of the second parameter. Uh, yes, exactly. Oh, that's a, good, that's a good point. So basically, the signature of what we're using here also dictates what we're, what we're launching, right? So we have A1, which is an integer, and we give true, which is a Boolean. So that basically matches this signature over here. Yeah, the same for this one over here. This is an integer, a constant integer, right? B1 is a Boolean, so we launch this one over here. Okay, was this the same question that you had? I want to ask this one, the previous one. Here? Yeah. Uh, why would we want to create an object of the base class inside the class? We don't create an object of the base class. The object is only one object, and this is the, uh, the subclass object. But... This object over here has the same attributes and functionality as the main one, um, and therefore can also call this constructor of the main class, which does some initialization already, right? Okay. And this constructor can then access, for instance, private variables over here, which we otherwise would not be able to access via our subclass. So it's basically accessing the private variable of the base class. Exactly. That is one of its uses, but maybe other things are happening here as well. Like, for instance, inside a constructor, you can, of course, launch methods of that class as well. Or you can do some very complicated uh, statements, in that case, that are needed for that particular class. You can create files, you can structure the memory in a certain way. And if you, if you are dependent on that from your subclass, you can do that straight away from your base class constructor. It's typically um, done a lot. I mean, especially if this base class has a lot of implementations already. This is something that you don't want to duplicate in your subclass. You want to, take, you want to have the base class take uh, control of all of this through its constructor over here. So this is basically saying launch the constructor of the base class with this parameter, and then this over here will be launched. So the statements that are in here will then be launched. But the object that you are in, when you created that object and then this um, uh, created this particular constructor over here is still the object of a subclass, right? There's no second object here. Okay. Yeah, but it's a very important uh, distinction uh, indeed. Also, like, the termination of the program, like the, uh, the structure of the base class would be called. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, so the, for the destructor, you can do exactly the same thing, um, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. There was a question in the back. No, no. Yeah. So basically, I mean, what you said is, is, is not entirely correct. So it's not that we are copying attribute. We're launching, in this case, we're calling the constructor. So we are, we're basically not just assigning values here of attributes. We're actually launching or calling this constructor over here. Once that is done, we implement or we basically... Uh, call all the statements that are part of this. Here in this case, there are no statements, but we could do also what is the body of this constructor afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, so what you can't, I mean, you do this all explicitly. I think that is what your question is getting at. 
So whenever you create an object, you use a, a particular signature. So if you have an object of my class, and you create this object, and it starts like my class, and then you just say M, for instance, and then if you have M and then between the parentheses, that is then also telling the compiler, also your executable, what type of, um, uh, what type of constructor you're launching. If between the parentheses you're, you're supplying an integer, then it's this constructor. If you supply a Boolean, then it's this one. If you supply first an integer and then a Boolean, then it's this one over here. Right? So that is how, that's something we knew already, right? So the, that is basically the overloading of, uh, of your constructor. What we see now is as you do this, you can actually have, you call one constructor and this constructor can call another constructor. And in this constructor over here, we have loads of implementations that we don't want to repeat in the other constructors, and therefore we call this constructor explicitly here. All right? It's not that hard, but you know, it it I mean, it makes also our life easier because it it creates code shortcuts, and we don't have to repeat our codes. That is of always better. Um, but it, it, it requires the syntax to be understandable, of course. Uh, so the syntax that we already knew has some new features now. See it as that way. Okay? All right. An example. So do these examples at home. Um, so in this case, we have a book class, which you know, is a book. And we're, we left out the private, publics, and... Um, protected over here. That's kind of part of the exercise. So the book has a constructor, as you can see over here. So the only thing you can do with a book is create an object that has a string name or a string with a name and a double with the value of this book, the price of this book. And then this is the title is then given the name, the price is given that value. And that's all that is happening in the constructor. And then we have a magazine which is a subclass of our um, superclass book. That's what is written over here. And we need to implement a few more things over here, especially the constructor of our magazine. A magazine is a more specific type of book because the magazine can have a discount, apparently, in this case. And so we have a kind of a, a method of this class magazine where it can add a discount to our particular magazine. So the idea is then that you use this magazine class now, an object of this magazine, like here. And the only way we can do this is by uh, initiate or initializing a const uh, uh, the constructor of this object with a string and with a value, right? It must be a double over here. It must be um, a, uh, a string over here. So that's what we provide. And I think we've done this not too many times before, but this over here is providing exactly a constant string that has the value C++ monthly. We could have just created also a C string, which would then be implicitly could be converted to what we have over here anyway. Right? So now we have an object called mag, which is of type magazine, the class. And now we can initiate or call in this case the methods show and discount, right? Show we can do because this is a method in book and it's up to us to make sure that this is a public one. Um, as well as discount, well, discount is a method of magazine already. So we also need to make sure that this is public over here, right? That's all. Now we need to implement this in such a way that uh, our discount methods also implements the discount. That is more of a little bit of a small programming uh, assignment. But the rest is really about understanding how constructors can launch other constructors because part of this assignment is really saying do construct this constructor in such a way that it only uses code in the base class constructor. That means you can't implement things in the constructor of magazine. Right? I hope you then get the drift and then implement what we've seen in the previous couple of slides. Right? It's basically just looking at those previous slides, implementing this particular thing. I gave it a one pepper, it should not be that hard. Another easier example to just you know, bring this message home is um, if you have, for instance, a graphical environment, you have sometimes loads of different type of shapes that you want to uh, represent there. There are libraries nowadays that do exactly this. But you know, this is you know, if you would start from scratch. So you could have these different shapes. And some of them are circles, some of them are rectangles, some of them are squares. 
And you can see that the square is a little bit like a rectangle, except that the width and the height of a square is exactly the same. Right? So a square is a bit more specific than a rectangle. And a rectangle or a triangle or a circle are all shapes that also have something in common because they have a position somewhere on the screen. Like this one is over here, this one is over here, this one is over here. Right? So that is kind of already hinting at the fact that you could implement this through multiple classes that inherit from each other. Uh, you could do this in multiple ways, uh, but in this example I do it in a very simplistic way. I have an element, which is a very simple class because it has just an XY position of our element, of our shape, basically. And you can initialize this only, or you can also create an object by providing the XY coordinates, which are then be given. Right? That is easy. And from this, we then derive those other type of shapes, like a rectangle and a square. Triangle and circle, I leave that also for at home. Should be fairly simple, uh, although may, maybe not. Uh, but I think what I wanted to show here is basically you can have a rectangle, which inherits everything from elements. That means it has an X and a Y position. And a rectangle at the same time also has a width and a height. So that is the A and B uh, attribute that you see over here. And then, a square is something more specific. So a square then inherits from rectangle. This you can do, and you can do on and on and on again. So square inherits from rectangle, rectangle inherits from elements, and then you have your elements, right? So that means square also has an X and Y position. Square also has uh, an A and a B over here. And the way this is implemented here is you can only create an object of class square by providing an x position, a y position, and a, which is the height or the width, because both of them are the same for a square. Right? So this is what it does. And you can see here how it's implemented using the new notation that we know. We basically launch here the constructor of rectangle with these parameters. And then from this, we launch the constructor of elements with these parameters, right? So this calls this, this calls this, right? So automatically things are then hierarchically called in terms of a constructor. And now the, the, the assignment of, of this example is really to add a method so that in square, we can have a method that prints out the XY coordinates of this thing. At the moment, we can't do this because these two are private. That means child classes can't access X and Y. They can give x and y through the constructor, but they can't do anything else. They can't access these uh, attributes. Uh, just to make sure that you understand what private really means, right? And again, I gave this just one, one pepper. Should be fairly simple. OK, then for uh, keywords that um, are a little bit beyond the introductory programming level, um, that are nice to know, but that only later we will see why, where and how those can be used in, in, in bigger programming concepts. Now the first one is mutable and is probably not that interesting yet, because mutable is only interesting to uh, have uh, the possibility for a class to keep a few or one attribute only changeable, even if an object of that class is constant. So if we create an object of a class and we assign it as a constant, that is what is happening here at line one in the main function, <coughs> sorry, um, then typically nothing can change anymore in our object A, right? Everything is constant. That's what the constant means. However, if we have then a mu if we then select mutable as a keyword in front of the attributes that we would have here for the Y attribute, for instance, then we would be able to do this over here. This would work, even though A is a constant, this one attribute Y is not, because it's mutable. We kind of leave this thing you know, open. Even if the whole object is constant, this thing is still variable. So that's basically what mutable means. And then later we'll see that sometimes it's very important to have constants of a, a constant object of a particular class. And in some cases, it is interesting to keep you know, one or, or, or a very select few uh, attributes then uh, mutable. So that you can still change those. The rest should all be frozen, like a constant should be, but that should be then uh, mutable. 
The same for using. Using is also a keyword where you can um, uh, inherit or we can control or bypass even uh, the inheritance properties of an attribute or even of met uh, methods. So here we have our class B, which is a subclass of superclass A, right? Class A is a very trivial class. It has a protected uh, member over here. That means um, if you have then uh, a child class, it can access X. That is not a problem. However, what we do here in this child class B, or this, base, uh, this uh, subclass B, is we inherit X, which belongs to our class A, as a public attribute. So we changed from protected to public now. Meaning, if we, in another function, like our main function, create an object of class B, then suddenly we can change this X attribute over here. Uh, we can access it because B can access it. You know, it is protected. But we use it here as a public attribute. Also, this has particular usage or uses where you can, even if a class needs to protect an attribute, and that makes a lot of sense when you start designing the class, there might be some situations where a child class needs to redefine this. And that is exactly doing this. So this child class has completely redefined uh, X over here, even though in the class declaration over here itself, X is protected. And therefore, this would not normally work. Right? That's the idea. And then through B, through the child class, you can then suddenly do this. Right? The child class opens up something from the base class. Okay? So that is, the, that is one way or one uh, use of the using keywords. A little bit uh, more interesting and just as uh, bypassing is a friend, uh, which has a kind of a higher level concept. Now, a friend is uh, something that you can put into a, uh, into a class somewhere. And that way, that class declares that another class or another function becomes a friend. And it's only in one direction, typically. So if you have a class A, then in a class A, you can design a function that is not part of this class, that is somewhere else defined. It doesn't even have to be a method of another class. It can be completely a global function, for instance. That this function is a friend. Or it can declare another class as a friend. And if, it's the, if this is the case, then it has access to all the private and protected attributes of that class. So it would be as if it would be a child class or a subclass, but on top, these friends have an extra benefit because they can also access the private parts of this class. So a friend in C++ is something really, really powerful, right? That basically means this class opens up completely to this friend. And it's happening from a particular class outwards to something, to a, a, a method or a function, or to a class, to another class. Um, and it's not symmetric, therefore. If A is saying class B is a friend, that does not mean that class B has to also declare class A as a friend. That means class B has access to all the private and protected members of class A, if class A declares class B as a friend, but not the other, the other way around. So class A cannot get everything from B. Right? So it's only one direction. Same for tra uh, transi transitive transitive relationship. So basically, if A is a friend of B and B is a friend of C, it does not mean that A is then also a friend of C. And that therefore, um, the, the, the content of C can be re read by, content A, by, by class A's methods. And so also, that is uh, not a guarantee. And the same for inherit, uh, inheriting things. So if something is happening for a base class, it does not mean that it can also then be, that the friendship tie is also happening for the subclass. Um, uh, for the superclass, uh, it does not happen that it's for the base class or the, the subclass or the child class. So friend is a very strict uh, line as well. That is not inherited, that is not transitioned towards other classes, or is not reflective. You know, that it's, it's only one direction. And this is how you would use this. So you have a class A over here, and you can then say somewhere in the class, 
that uh, class B is a friend. So you just do this with friend keyword and say friend class B. And then from this uh, point onwards, class B is indeed a friend. So um, in this case, what happens then is that class B can access everything from class A, even though this X over here is private. Right? This X is private. B is a completely different class. Normally, it would never get access to X over here. However, since A also said class B is my friend, class B can actually do this. Can access A's private attribute X in this case. All right. So this would work, and this would um, write out what you would expect it would write out. So that is how one class can declare that another class can access all its private and protected members. And that would be saying, it's my, he's my friend or she's my friend. You can also do this from a method. And this method is basically a function in general for C++. So any function could be also declared explicitly as a friend. It doesn't have to be a class. It could also be a function or a method. And this friend method is exact, doing exactly the same. So basically, you say here as class A, it's not a class. It's basically a function. This is a function signature, right? So function A or a function, the function funct, with the name funct, which has a uh, parameter a of class a, and returns an integer, well, this class over here is a friend. Mm -hmm. And then from then onwards, this particular function can then access everything that belongs to that class. Also, that is a very powerful concept. You basically then say there is a method completely outside of this class that has a particular signature, and this method can access everything that I have in my class. And this can be sometimes done, for instance, for particular very special functions. Like, for instance, operators, as we see later. Like some operators, like the stream operators, for instance, use exactly this functionality. Sometimes these stream operators can access attributes that are private of particular classes that have never been opened. But since those classes have declared that operator or that function as a friend method, these then suddenly have access to everything that class has. Right? So that's, that's one of the ways you can do this. So this function over here can then be executed with a particular object of class A. And then even though this class over here has X as a private attribute, it can just access this because this is a friend, mem uh, a friend method. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, then you have a problem. Exactly, exactly. So you need to, you need to, I mean, this is indeed another thing. You need to be able to uh, allow the compiler to see which this function is, of course. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And here is a, a third example for you to do at home, an assignment, um, so that... Uh, uh, you kind of get this concept as well about the friend uh, concept. So here we have the class rectangle. Um, the class rectangle has multiple constructors, as you can see. Um, and we do exactly what has been kind of introduced in the previous slide. So all you need to see is what is written in the previous slide. We want a friend method to access whatever we have in our rectangle, width and height, for instance. Um, those are private, so we can't normally access them. We want to open this up to a particular method. And this method is called enlarge. Um, uh, where is it saying that it should uh, be called enlarge? Ah, here. I should have mentioned this here again, but anyway. So this enlarge should basically double both the width and the height of our rectangle. So it's a function. It's not a method of this class. It's a function that's completely decoupled from this class. But the class should kind of announce that this is a, a friend method. So that what we do over here is say, when we say we have a rectangle one, which we uh, start with our default constructor, which we have to mention here because we have another more specific constructor. And we have rectangle two, which we construct with our, def with our second constructor here, which is uh, our position. Uh, that we give along. So this is rectangle 2 is starting at two uh, at uh, position 3, 4. And then we assign rectangle 1 the outcome of that function, namely enlarge, where we pass rectangle 2. Right? This is what you can do. We basically, there's nothing out of the ordinary. Ordinary, a function can take um, an object 
of a particular class as a um, as a parameter and it can return this as well and how to return this is now the the option maybe this is two peppers i'm not sure we'll see um, but then what should come out of here is that we basically then get the area of this first rectangle which is now uh, which has the height um, six and or width what is first the width six and the height uh, eight so six times eight is 48 as the area of the of the first rectangle so the assignment is here make this fit create this method over here that allows to do this if you see if you've seen the previous slides i think this should not be too difficult yep Uh, no, because basically what you have here is, oh, right, you, uh, I see what you mean. No, you don't have to. But there's a default one that we have. Yes, exactly. Um, if, and this, so basically this is something that we'll pan out on. So just as we've seen the copy constructor, I think we're already in the slides. There's the equal operator that has very similar um, things that we have to pay attention to, you know, Keyword here is shallow copy versus deep copy. Then it would be sometimes necessary to have this operator here. In this case, however, not. We don't need to because we can rely on the fact that we have here a shallow copy. Yeah. That will come. But thank you for that. You know, keep that in mind. We have also move. Uh, uh, yeah, well, we'll see. You know, there's, there's more things that, that uh, will be introduced. But I want to do this at, you know, a nice regular pace. We're only in week five still, right? Okay, and then finally, the, the fourth keyword that I promised to uh, take is the delete keyword. Now, this is also a very inter interesting one already that you might have already thought about because if you have many different uh, constructors or if you have constructors and you want to absolutely avoid that one of those constructors can be called at all, then this is a little bit hard. Because as I said, the compiler typically is matching the constructor and this can be done implicitly by looking at the attributes that you're, or the uh, parameters that you're providing and you can then sometimes um, uh, have default ones or you can have implicit conversion. And those two things can mess with your program. And you want as a programmer sometimes to forbid this, you know, to make sure that this is definitely ruled out. Now, in this case, for instance, I have an element, I have for this a particular constructor over here, and I might want to completely forbid that anyone can have an element, an uh, object of my element, and then copy this element. So what I can do in this case, I mean, I, I can, um, uh, well, there's not much you can do because if I don't explicitly say that there's a copy constructor, then I will have my default copy constructor, as we just uh, explained uh, for, the, for the equal operator, or the assignment operator. Um, in this case, what you can do is say, for this copy constructor equals delete, meaning that if somebody or somehow my object is, uh, is calling a copy constructor, which is called op automatically, as we saw uh, two lectures ago, then the um, compiler will generate a warning, or not a warning, an error. Because there is no such thing as a copy constructor when you explicitly delete it this way. So you say with this equals delete to the compiler, there is no such thing. And it means if this compiler, if the compiler is trying to call this particular constructor, then it will uh, lead to an error. And this is not just for constructors, this is for everything that is uh, as the, the method uh, a signature of, of a class. So for normal methods like sitx over here, in this case we want to make sure that the user always gives us a double. So for our setx over here, we create an, an, an element, uh, an object of uh, type element here, and then we can call setx because this is a public method. Then this works if we give it a double. However, if we would give it a float over here, it would fail. Right? And then that would not be the case sometimes. Right? So we want to make it very explicitly here that we create a double. For instance, because our set X does something that really needs to have a double, and if we try to take, or if we want to have a, a float over here, then something might go wrong. Okay? 
So this is how we can be very, very restrictive as programmers for people using our class. So once we created our class over here, we make sure that the compiler throws an error if people that are use our class use it in a particular way. So copying our element over here, for instance, would create an error. Um, launching this with a float, like over here, would also create an error while compiling this. That's what this equal delete uh, operator does. <clears throat> All right, and then uh, as a fifth assignment, uh, it's basically more of an open-ended uh, assignment again. We'll go for our maze game again, um, where I changed a few more things. So we'll add to the version. Um, and we now not have just the maze class over here, but also the player class. I can actually just go, because I typically do this uh, already pre-compiled so, or uh, pre-prepared. Um, so in our main function, right, we basically now have more or less the same except that when we start a maze, we can now load a maze from a file. And this file is basically a text file which we interpret as we construct an object of our class maze. So we create, um, or we have here a particular file, which is at, a, at this point, this map file is just a string, which is pointing to a particular file, which is having these type of contents. So. As, as you probably or hopefully remember from our last version of our maze, we just have zeros and ones in an array. Now this array is basically just a file. We read this file, we look for the contents, and then we basically put these contents into, uh, into the array that we already have anyway. So back to here. So now after this, we have an object called maze where we already loaded the contents of this file into our array. And we do this in a very dynamic way, because now we can. We've seen pointers. We can know how to create a dynamic array. So by looking at this file and look at the width and the height of this matrix that is in this file, we create a matrix ourselves, um, or an array ourselves. And this array is then uh, part of our maze objects, just like it was before. But now we load this from a file. right? The new thing, the other new thing is that we now have a second class called player. And like that, we can just create multiple players, in this case two, which we initialize at a certain position of the maze. And then we go through our game. So as soon, as long as the player does not press Q, right, we draw our maze with um, hashes as the, wa the walls with the color uh, scheme two, as from N curses, if you remember still. Then we play our players with these particular symbols and these particular colors. And then we look at what is given or what is input by the user. And since we have two players now, we need to take care of the key presses of player one. Uh, those are over here. And we need to take care of the, the key presses of player two. Those are over here. Other than that, this is still a very manageable kind of small main function, I would say. Uh, it, it creates three objects, two players in the maze, and those are being drawn and updated each time. So if we can really look at, at the maze, for instance, we see that not much has happened here, um, except that uh, some things have uh, taken out. Um, the constructor is a little bit bigger. Um, I hope you all will look at that because that kind of um, shows you a couple of tricks, a couple of nice tricks to kind of load a file, and then how to deal with certain things that are not that obvious in C++, like for instance, getting the width and the height of our matrix in this file, for instance. So here, what, the way I did this, and I'm sure there's better ways, if you have them, just let me know. Um, I count the number of commas in each, in the first column. So as soon as our first column arrives, that's what this means over here, I count the number of commas in this first line. So the first line is a string, from the beginning of the string to the end of the string, I look at each character, and if it is a comma, I count it. So that's what this particular uh, method does over here. Note that it's using a lambda expression over here. Right? That's what you should know already. So if I count the number of columns, then I have one less than the number of elements per row, so I just add one. And, and then I have, at the end, our number of columns of our matrix and the number of lines of our matrix. The lines is easy. There I just count the number of lines that I can read in my file. 
And that is basically the content that I've read out. And this is something that I put in in, um, in our uh, maze uh, thing. And that we construct while it is running, while our program is running. So basically, we from that can see the length, uh, the X and the Y length of our maze. And then we construct our maze at runtime, right? That's something that we've seen last lecture. And then we fill this with our symbols in the right way. Right? Try to look at this. I think this is um, one way of, uh, of dealing with this. Uh, if you have a better and especially shorter way, let me know. I'll be very interested. Our player has basically the very similar or very similar things as we saw already. It can be drawn. Uh, note also the const. Remember, a const behind the method means that this method is not changing the attributes of this class, right? And also what we do in our player uh, or the, the methods are very, very simple. So there's not much that happens. We needed to uh, add a little bit to our make file because we have our uh, player in this case, but that's it, you know, not much changed. So if we now make this and compile this, then we have our maze. And now with the two key combinations, we can control player one over here, if you can see it, and with the other key, I can do this at the same time, but you know we can then have two players running around the maze at the same time, right? It's a multiplayer game suddenly. Right, so that is uh, the current state. Now for this assignment, you need to use now your new knowledge about, for instance, the friend class, uh, or yeah, friend classes, um, or as well as um, uh, inheritance. So basically, you need to modify. The, uh, the new maze game in such a way that we can kind of abstract things, that we can have a new type of player, which is a more specific player, uh, which is also our enemy, which can uh, move um, towards our uh, player itself. And by able to, do, or how do we do this is one way, that's the algorithmic question of this assignment. But also how do you do this in a, in a structural way? How do we create this child class and how can we give to particular methods, the right type of um, uh, of attributes of our super class or parent class. So hopefully, I ask this question in such a way with the contents that we've seen in this uh, today's class that you can answer this. So I want the the main class to be much shorter. You know, so it's even shorter because we don't have those those key. Uh, uh, that, that dealing with the keys anymore. Whenever we say we have a new player, we just say these are the key combinations that we can initialize this object as. When we have an, an enemy object, then it just needs a location. And then as the game is moving, our player can move the, with those keys. That's what we assume in this draw function over here, which we need to change. Yeah, so the, the draw function has this key press. That is easy. However, our enemy object, which is a child of our player, should have a different type of draw function, which then also takes the player as a parameter and then should access somehow uh, the right attributes of this player. And doing this requires a few tricks that we have seen, and there are at least two that you could go for. So this is a little bit more open-ended. I should have given it three or four peppers, right? Because this is a little bit harder than the simple assignments that we've seen earlier. Okay, is this clear? If not, ask us questions or send us emails. Right, then to the polymorphism uh, part. Now, polymorphism is a way to create a base object with methods that, uh, through overriding those objects, and overriding is here the, the part that really matters, changes the behaviors of whatever the child classes do with exactly the same methods. So you have child classes and parent classes, or subclasses and superclasses, with methods that have exactly the same name. And if you have that, you override those. It's not um, overloading, as we've seen with the constructors up until now, or other methods of the same class. Now we override those by having a, a child class that overrides uh, this particular member function or methods. Now what you can do, however, is over here. If a sub over here is a, su a subclass of super, then we can say that these two things are possible. We can take a pointer 
uh, to an object of class super and immediately assign it the address of our subclass object, right? We, which we created over here. That means we can mix here a little bit. The same for uh, the reference. We can here have a reference um, to, uh, our, uh, to our super, an, to an object of our super class and assign this to um, the object that we already have of our subclass. That means there, there, there are links possible between the subclass and the superclass. Um, and that is allowing us, or that is one ingredient of polymorphism, which has certain uh, interesting um, attributes or uh, interesting features. What is also important, however, is that this is only one uh, direction, not the other direction, which will in a second become uh, 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 clear. So you can do this assignment, but not the other way around. You can't just have, in that case, a pointer of a subclass, and which is then assigned to a superclass. Right? That is not a possibility. <clears throat> so if we have two classes that inherit from another class, and we call those dog and fish, which are both types of animals. So dog is a child class of animal, and fish is a, a child class or a subclass of animal. And all of those classes have a print method. Now what we want is we want to have, or that is what polymorphism really means, is we can have a pointer to an animal class. So the more abstract class, the less specific or the more general class, right? And we then can, with this animal, uh, or this animal pointer to our animal class, create a very specific animal class, namely a dog class, right? which is a, a child class or a subclass of our animal class, and initialize that as a particular constructor of our dog class. And we can then launch print, which then does something very specific to that dog. Like it prints, for instance, I am Scooby Bark, because we gave it the name Scooby, and inside our dog class, we then have the method print, who then specifically outputs this particular thing. It outputs these attributes, uh, the name of our animal, plus also it barks, because that's what dogs do. However, that same animal we can then reassign. This would be silly, we have to delete this first normally, but anyway. Uh, we can reassign to a completely different child class of our animal. And we can basically say we can now create a fish. Fish, in this case, has also a string, but this string has a completely different meaning. It's kind of like a species of our fish, namely sam salmon, and that uh, prints out something completely different. That means I'm salmon, so not I'm a, or, or I, I, my name is salmon, and it's a fish. So it's somehow printed differently, meaning this print method over here is the method that belongs to our fish class. This print method here is the method that belongs to our dog class. But we use here the pointer to an object of the animal class, to the more generic class. So this over here is exactly the same as this over here. This line is the same. So we don't know from this line that we have a fish or a dog. right? We, in, in a way, in another way, putting this um, uh, C++ or our compiler needs to make sure that we check here for what type of child class this is. It's a little bit of an extra jump or an extra thing, a piece of work, but it's done automatically. And this is called polymorphism. So our animal here morphs, morphs between a dog and a fish over here. So we have something that belongs to our superclass, and then it's basically assigned something of our subclass, and through then calling the methods of these subclasses, it changes the behavior. Okay? That is a very, very simple thing. The other thing that we need to know, however, is that we need to declare these methods in the animal class as something special. Because otherwise, C++ would just call animals print methods. And because of that, we need to assign this, this virtual keyboard, saying we do here something else, which we call a late binding, as we'll see in a second. So this is, in a nutshell, polymorphism, right? So our animal pointer to an object of animal can now change between a dog and a fish or many other things. And then if we then create a method that is the same for, uh, that has the same name for all of them, this method is then overwritten and basically changes its behavior. 
So here our animal prints out a thing that is specific for a dog. Here our animal prints out the, same, the specific thing for a fish. And that's a very high-level toy example, but I hope it brings the message home of what it means to be um, a polymorphism. So here is how you would uh, create this. So this is the code for this. Uh, with uh, an extra bit to kind of uh, go beyond this and see how interesting this can be. So here we do have indeed our class animal. It has just a protected string species, meaning everything that uh, derives from animal can still connect uh, or get the species string over here. Um, we have our animal constructor over here and we have our print method, which is here virtual. And by saying virtual here, we tell C++ that we do the binding of our print method late. Meaning that uh, when we have a child class of this class over here, we don't take what is implemented here. We don't use these statements. We basically let this um, uh, method be overwritten by something that is uh, following, you know, by one of the child classes members, uh, methods of the same name. For instance, dog is doing something exactly the same. So basically, the dog has exactly the same print methods. Uh, we don't need to virtualize this in this case because uh, it ends at, at dog. Um, and we have a completely different behavior over here. So what could be here are completely different type of statements as the statements that you have over here of the superclass. So the subclass has a completely different print method than the, than the superclass. Sometimes the superclass doesn't have to implement anything as we will later see. Um, and the same goes for the fish in that case. So the fish does also something completely different. It basically outputs something completely different doing other things, right? So this print method for the fish is doing something completely different from the print methods of a dog that we saw earlier. Yes? The virtual is also acting as a default or do we have to write virtual when we do polymorphism? Yes, we have to write virtual in the base class, but not in the child classes in this case. But we can. You're absolutely right there. That's, I think we have it even written somewhere in the slides. Uh, but more about it later as well. So also there we can, um, uh, there are some, some cases where it does not need to be and in other cases where it definitely needs to be uh, um, mentioned. So what happens here in the main class of this little program is we have here an array of animals. So all of these elements of this array of size four will be filled with animals. And we're filling them as well. So the first element is a dog, the second one is a fish, the other one is another dog with a different name, uh, and then the third one is another animal. So we don't have then specific objects. Well, actually we do. We have an array of specific objects. These objects, however, are animals, are not specifically dogs or fish. They are dogs or fish or even animals. So even the super class that we have to our availability. And then a number of times, so 15 times, we then randomize, pick one of those animals and then print uh, that animal's uh, print method or call that animal's print method. Right? So basically we do this 15 times and then we just select one of these, these animals which we then assign to a pointer of an object of this type animal, of the base class. And then this base class uh, just assigns its print. So inside this loop, this for loop over here, we have no knowledge about what is a fish, what is a dog, or what is an animal, right? So if you just go from this line onwards, we are dealing here with animals that are being printed, but by knowing which animals those are in the structure, in the, in the array that we have over here, magically we are printing the right thing. So if this is a fish, then it's printing the fish print. If this is a dog, then it's printing the dog print. If this is an animal, then it's doing what an animal is printing. Right? So that is the idea, or the rough idea behind polymorphism. Um, so note in this case that uh, we have an animal, of, animal of, of the base class animals. So we never have something that is... Uh, so the array itself has objects of animals. And those objects can be specified, either as an animal, uh, as something of the class itself, but they can also be specified as a dog or as a fish. Uh, that is uh, what we do then through these uh, pointers over here. 
And then we uh, call the print methods. That means uh, while we execute this, because this is all at runtime, you know, our random function decided what we were having, a dog or a fish or something else. We basically then um, uh, invoke the right print methods. And then, you know, a, 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 an execution of this could show this, for instance. So 15 times randomly, we choose one of those four elements. And then no matter what we choose, we print the right thing. And that is the idea here. <clears throat> now, this is the short explanation why what, or what virtual does. So whenever we have a function call, we typically just jump to whatever the function does in memory. Right? That is what typically is, is used or well, how C even works as well. Now, what we do here when we are overwriting a function is that we do this through late binding. So we don't immediately jump to the implementation of the print method of the base class, we basically see what, this, uh, what the type of this object is. If this is an animal or if this is one of its child classes, a dog or a fish. That means this binding of the function is done at a later stage while you're running the program. And that means that you need to explicitly tell C++ to do this. And this is done with the virtual keywords. So that is kind of the short, uh, the, the short explanation of that. Um, and, I mean, that was uh, what your question was about. We don't always need virtual, so you can actually mention virtual um, <coughs> in the, in the, um, base in the base class and the super class, but you don't need to do this over here. So here it is optional, right? <coughs> okay, so this is a, a, a very small example that due to the time constraints, I will quickly jump over it because... Um, I also wanted to say overwrite. What overwrite does is basically uh, make sure that a method um, um, uh, stops. So basically that the, the method is virtual and that it is always overriding a virtual um, a base class function. So if we have a function or a method funct in this case, which is a method of class B, which is a child class or a subclass of class A, then these two methods uh, over here, we can uh, ensure that this uh, function is virtual by saying override. That means this function is meant to override a function of the uh, super class of this particular class. If this were not the case, then C++ will throw an error. That is what, uh, what will happen there. It's kind of to make sure uh, that if you don't have control about the base class, for instance, Somebody write class A, puts this nicely in a header file, and CPP file, or into an object that people then can use, and you want to derive from this class, or you want to inherit from this class, and you want to make sure that this never changes. In that case, you put this override over here. So later, this other person who is in charge of class A then removes this virtual over here will mean that this is then picked up at compile time. And that is the advantage of uh, the override keyword over here. Um, <clears throat> the, fine, the final keyword can also uh, be used for the entire class. And if you do this for an entire class, not just for a method, then it may, from C++ 11 onwards, this is sl slightly newer, uh, then in, it prevents inheriting from classes or overriding methods in derived classes. So in that case, um, uh, having, for instance, um, a class B that is saying, I'm going to inherit everything from our class A will directly re result in a compile error because you say A is final. So from class A, nothing can be derived anymore. So nothing can be uh, overridden anymore, but also you can't, uh, you can't inherit from this anymore. Or for class C and class D, if you then uh, create not a final class, but you say final is in this case at the end of our method over here, so we have a virtual void from final, then you say you basically stop here in uh, allowing other classes to override this method, right? So you, this method, when it is final, can't be overridden anymore, right? So this over here will also lead to a compiler error. Yes? Why 
even though it's final, it doesn't allow where I yeah, because, I mean, so basically, yeah, you're right. So basically, the virtual would not be a necessity here. Um, however, um, okay, that's a good question, actually. I don't have a direct answer to that. Why would you then use, uh, why, why would you use then final? Because only that way you could overwrite uh, our, fu uh, our, our function over here. Um, hmm. I can't directly think of a direct answer there, unless somebody can help me here. Why would you have both virtual and final here? We'll leave it as a homework. Thanks. <laughs> All right, and this is uh, also where I wanted to stop. So basically, th that kind of gives you the main elements of inheritance and polymorphism. In the next lectures, we'll of course go beyond this, uh, or we will use all of this. So make sure to do also the assignments, even the MACE 5.0 assignments, because I think it will show you how to use some of those new keywords that have been shown today. We'll take a 15 minute break now, so a little bit, so five past two, we'll start with the in-class assignments. All right, time to take a break. Thank you very much.